Welcome to the Dean's Forum here at Johns Hopkins University SICE. I'm Kent Calder, uh, Interim Dean here at SICE, and my guest today is Professor John Eikenberry, uh, Albert Milbank Professor of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton University. Professor Eikenberry is uh, currently co-director of Princeton's Center for International Security Affairs and the author of eight books, many of which, of course, uh, our uh, participants know well. Most recently, A World Safe for Democracy, which will be the uh, principal subject of our discussion today. Uh, one of uh, John's previous books, After Victory, won the Schroeder Jervis uh, Prize of the American Political Science Association, as you may know, as the best book uh, in international history and politics for the year it was published. Uh, Professor Eikenberry, apart from his academic work, of course, he also has policy experience with the State Department's policy planning staff at the very end of the Cold War. And shortly after, he was also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, Kissinger Summers Commission on the Future of US-European relations. John, uh, it's a real uh, pleasure to uh, have you with us. I see that in the background, you have a copy of your book, uh, A World Safe for Democracy. And I must say the, the cover there with uh, St. Paul's Cathedral, if I'm not mistaken, um, rising above the smoke and the fires of the Blitz really is a, uh, a symbolic testimony to the issues uh, that you are looking at uh, in your book. And uh, of course, the phrasing, if I'm not mistaken, also a world safe for democracy uh, is out of Woodrow Wilson. And I wondered if you could start by giving us a sense of what you feel that means and how your particular interpretation is distinctive. Thank you, uh, Dean Calder. It's great to be with you. Uh, uh, we're old friends and it's, it's just a pleasure to be on the screen with you and to see you again. And thank you for the invitation to talk about my book. Um, yes, the book really began as a set of lectures at the University of uh, Virginia. Uh, uh, really the week after the 2016 election. So uh, I, I had a fairly subdued audience uh, mm -hmm. uh, for a, a week of lectures on, on, on international uh, uh, liberalism, uh, uh, how to exactly. think about the long history of liberal internationalism. And uh, I wasn't sure whether I was going to be writing a, a, an obituary for liberal internationalism or or a, a kind of moment where it would be reinvented. And we'll probably get to that today, talking a little bit about the future. But the book tries to, to uh, speak to today's moment, to, to acknowledge that we're at a kind of world historical turning point, that, that the, 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 the international order that we've lived in for many decades, both during the Cold War and afterwards, has, has upended itself, that there's a kind of general lost confidence in collective solutions to common problems, uh, basic questions as scholars of international relations are back on the table. What are the sources of international order? Uh, can liberal democracy get its uh, act together and reinvent itself? Capitalism and democracy, can, can it be brought back into balance? And the question I really ask in this book is, what is the future of liberal internationalism as a, as a way of thinking about and acting in the world, as a kind of cooperative organization of the global system uh, to, to speak to uh, and uh, support the, 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 the life, the life uh, activities of liberal democracy. And my fir first move, uh, Kent, in the book uh, has been to take the long view to, to look back, uh, uh, making the argument that uh, liberal internationalism didn't begin in 1989, or, or even for that matter in 1945, but has been with us for 200, 250 years. And it's been a tradition of, uh, uh, which really cut, has come into the world with the, the rise of liberal democracy in the late uh, 18th, early 19th century. And that it's gone through many, many um, uh, uh, phases and eras, uh, uh, golden eras and crises, 
uh, deep contestation, close run things. Arthur Schlesinger at the end of the 20th century wrote an essay in Foreign Affairs and said, looking back over the last century, uh, liberal democracy in the 30s and early 40s really uh, it could have gone the other way. It was really a skin of the teeth kind of moment, a, a, a moment when uh, an extinction moment, if you will. And, and indeed, the 1930s and 40s have been very uh, interesting to me as a kind of place to look uh, to find uh, uh, inspiration, perhaps uh, what I would call a, a usable past, uh, lessons from the past to speak to today's moment of, of crisis. Um, uh, one of the books that really made an impact on me was Ira Katz Nelson's book, uh, uh, Desolation and, and Enlightenment, which looks at the 1930s and 40s, the, you might say the generation of 1945, uh, internationalist liberals who uh, in their lifetime were trying to make sense of the catastrophes around them, the Great Depression, the rise of fascism, the rise of communism, uh, the, the uh, advent of total war, uh, uh, the, the Holocaust, and then, of course, the dropping of the atomic bomb, all of that in their own, uh, in their own lifetime. And, and uh, at that moment, uh, what did they do? Well, they, they picked up the pieces. They, they, they looked back and, and, and attempted to re-envisage what open societies would look like, uh, uh, reconstructing uh, and building on the lessons and the legacies of, 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 of liberal democracy and, and liberal internationalism. And so what I'm trying to do in this book is, is make the case that, that it's not an ephemeral kind of way of looking at the world, that there's kind of an intellectual gravitas about this tradition of, of, of world order building, uh, that it, it is a mixed record uh, to be honest with the failures as well as the accomplishments. It's not, uh, uh, it's not something that simply is is wonderful, and we should accept everything that's been done on, on under the auspices of liberal internationalism. There's there is failure and 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 missteps, and then finally uh, to 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 think about how it might be reinvented. Uh, what I might say to kind of get us going here is to to say a little bit more about uh, that phrase that you mentioned and what what liberal internationalism really is. Um, as 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 I suggest. Uh, the, the most famous uh, phrase that seems to define the essence of liberal internationalism is Wilson's phrase, to, uh, World War I, a, a war, war to make the world safe for democracy. Uh, what, what I suggest in, in my book is that th we can read that uh, as it typically has been, as a kind of uh, idealist crusade to, to make the world in America's image, to, to bring the blessings of liberty to to all shores of the world, but that's not what I would say is the essence of liberal internationalism. A second reading is, is a literal reading of the phrase uh, to make uh, liberal democracies safe and to do so by building uh, an order, a framework, uh, a, an environment, a, an ecosystem uh, around which these uh, countries that are more fragile than we often uh, remember, and, and as we probably thought they were after 1989, when they looked like they were the, the only types of polities that could, could survive and prosper in the world, that they're more uh, like orchids that need a terrarium or need an environment. And that, that's what I am getting at in this book, that, that uh, liberal, the, 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 the project of liberal internationalism is the project of building order so that liberal democracies can manage their mutual vulnerabilities, can, can create mechanisms to balance what are, we have to admit, uh, conflicting values and principles at the heart of liberal democracy. Think about it. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, liberty and equality, uh, those are both inside of liberal democracy as, as norms, but they are inconsistent. Uh, you can't have 100% of both. Uh, individualism and community, uh, sovereignty and interdependence. Uh, there, the, the, the life of, uh, in liberal democracies is, is a life of balancing, of trade-offs, often uh, tragic choices, and liberal internationalism is in some sense creating the platform uh, upon which these societies can, can make those kind of balancing trade-offs, creating a zone of cooperation uh, to manage interdependence. And in some ways, that's what, what is at the heart of the the liberal international vision, a, a set of convictions, uh, 
which I could list, uh, that openness properly managed is good. That's number one. Number two, that that uh, 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 that institutions, uh, mo often multilateral institutions, facilitate cooperation. Number three, that democracies have a special uh, set of capacities and inclinations to work with each other. Uh, that leads us into the discussion of the democratic peace, but there is something uh, that leads these, these countries to find common cause over and over again in different eras. And then finally, uh, what brings liberal internationalism into view is this conviction that uh, under conditions of rising economic and security interdependence, uh, I, I use a, a loftier term, under conditions of modernity, uh, as a, the world is mobilizing through science, technology, the transformation of industrial societies, the rising interdependence across zones, economic security and environmental, that these countries uh, find it in their interest to work together, that uh, to use, uh, I think uh, my colleague uh, Robert Cohen put it that uh, under conditions of rising interdependence, the costs of lost autonomy associated making, with making binding commitments to other countries is, is less than the gains that follow from the coordination of your policies. So that's a very liberal internationalist conviction. Perhaps that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the, the essence uh, of it. So I, 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 in this book, I, I try to excavate and, and uh, uh, make these various uh, moves, uh, uh, historical, intellectual, theoretical moves, uh, starting with this notion of, 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 of order building uh, an ecosystem. Uh, 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 democracies are like eggs and it, liberal internationalism is building egg cartons so that these, these, uh, these, uh, these, these entities can survive, not uh, as uh, realists would have it, they are, they're not uh, billiard balls on a, on a pool table. So there's a very different framing of the problems of, of world politics coming out of this tradition. Now, the next thing I'll say, uh, getting us a little closer to to the, the, the actual historical experience, uh, there has been, uh, n without a doubt, a kind of intellectual recession for liberal internationalism that, that we, we hear and, and have lived through uh, several decades where, uh, where liberal internationalism and, and the, the order that has been built under its auspices, the American-led liberal international order, the post-1945 order has clearly uh, been seen now to, 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 to be uh, a disappointment, to, to have failed in important respects. And I think of three failures that have been uh, uh, put at the feet of liberal internationalism. One is the Iraq war, which uh, in some renderings uh, is, a, is an example of how liberal states can, can uh, go beyond uh, uh, their uh, a kind of realist uh, restraint impulse uh, and uh, and get uh, get into trouble. Uh, uh, I, I dispute that particular argument about uh, the source of the Iraq War, but the Iraq War has uh, undermined or delegitimated uh, internationalists, uh, particularly in the Republican Party. The 2008 financial crisis clearly uh, discredited or undermined uh, uh, inter internationalists on, on on the left and on the Democratic Party, and and thirdly. The what we might call the liberal bet that China could be invited into the liberal international order and it would be a responsible stakeholder and in some sense fall in line uh, in, within a kind of American-led or Western-led uh, liberal order that too uh, has has seen to to have not turned out well uh, and so part of what I'm doing in this book is to acknowledge those sorts of uh, of, 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 of of current uh, maladies and 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 failings, but to to step back and, and suggest that the deeper experience has been been one of, of, of a quite extraordinary uh, accomplishment, uh, recalling and defending uh, uh, the liberal international project across across two centuries uh, after 1945, of course, and this is. Uh, work that I've done over the years, not just in this book, of looking at the the building of 
of, of, of the American uh, system, as I, I sometimes call it, uh, uh, the, the American-led order. Uh, it's an order that is, has been uh, partly because of the liberal international vision and impulses that come out of it, uh, something that's not empire on the one hand, but it's not simply balance of power order on the other. There's a kind of creative uh, mix of, of, of ordering principles that, that the U.S. after World War II and into the current period have been part of, a kind of far-flung order with institutions, alliances, partnerships, shared values, a bargain, strategic, uh, shared strategic interests, creating an order that has been open but managed, uh, that, uh, that has created great prosperity, physical security, glimmerings of social justice. And, and Kent, in the, the, the middle part of the book, I, 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 I talk about the, the, the kind of work that a, a liberal international order uh, of the sort I've been describing here has done uh, in this, uh, this recent period, the last 70 years. Uh, think about, uh, about, about the, the kind of functional uh, problem solving and, and political ordering uh, uh, activities uh, that we've seen and often we fail to appreciate. The opening of the world economy after the Great Depression or uh, ushering in a kind of a golden era, bringing uh, Germany and Japan, Japan, a country you, you are one of the world's experts in understanding uh, um, uh, into the, into the, uh, into the post-war order and, and, re and those countries having a kind of space to redefine their identities as great powers. Uh, Germany and, and France uh, uh, finding a way to bind themselves together uh, uh, not balanced, but bind, uh, uh, and thereby launch the European project. Um, uh, and the uh, larger uh, population of, 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 of capitalist democracies uh, after World War II, redefining what it meant, means to be a liberal democracy, to, to bring uh, social democracy uh, and the welfare state uh, into the center of of these uh, post-war coalitions, these growth coalitions, these these uh, uh, these these compromise elites that were finding a way to both create uh, uh, conditions for trade and growth and and the social contract, uh, trilateral cooperation. The the G seven is is a kind of emblem of of a of a renaissance in, in international institutions. Uh, 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 bringing uh, real hardworking uh, intergovernmental tools to, to the problems of organizing and managing interdependence, providing a home for rising uh, and transitioning democracies. I, I go to uh, South Korea every year, have for 20 years, and South Korea is, is, is the poster child for, for the uh, implications of what liberal internationalism has wrought in the world over the last century, creating a, a place for a country to throw off military dictatorship and find a, its own pathway uh, of, of, of market, uh, uh, market democracy. Um, and then of course, China as, while uh, uh, it is now in many ways uh, contesting uh, the liberal order under American hegemonic auspices, uh, few countries have, have fared better than it has uh, uh, over the last several decades uh, uh, under what we sometimes call Pax Americana, China has had its, its best decades in two millennia. Uh, so uh, there has been an extraordinary story here that I, I, I think um, as we uh, sort through the failures and accomplishments, we should, uh, we should think about that. And, and it, it, it helps uh, us, and this is what I will just kind of end up here, Kent, with the kind of, well, what went wrong if everything was so good? Uh, well, uh, this is where I, I think in some ways my most, um, uh, uh, the, for me, my most uh, interesting uh, contribution in the book is, to, is, 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 to, is thinking about the liberal order as a kind of club. It wasn't a, a universal global order. It was really a, a kind of uh, a mutual aid society 
uh, 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 for liberal democracies, a, a kind of system in which they could work together to create resources and capacities to, to make their, own, their domestic systems work better, to protect their, their Republican constitutional polities, uh, uh, to create, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and, and, and in, along the way to, in, in being inside of the, the, this kind of club of, of that provided security and economic uh, opportunity, uh, uh, rights and responsibilities, obligations, a, a kind of what I call a logic of conditionality. If you're in this uh, club, you, you get the benefits of membership, but there are, of course, costs and obligations. And, and, and that, for me, is the essential move, mid-century move of the liberal international project. It separates what Roosevelt was, uh, was, was, was ushering in that was different from Woodrow Wilson. That the Rooseveltian internationalism was was truly uh, a, 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 an innovation in that it left behind the Wilsonian view that you could the that that the, the, that cooperation could be uh, could be enforced, if you will, by uh, the 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 pressure of public opinion. Uh, that was the 19th century view of, of internationalism. That was the, the view that Wilson have, had. But Roosevelt knew that that wasn't going to work in, the, in an era of, of, of industrial societies, of fascist and communist competitors. So what was the glue that was going to hold these countries together? Well, it was this club, club, uh, this club logic, the logic of conditionality. To be inside was to take on certain obligations. And so my punchline here is that with the end of the Cold War, when in some sense the, the world was celebrating uh, that liberal democracy was now uh, the uh, wide, widely understood uh, a victor in, in what history was telling us about how states and types of states uh, would perform, uh, it was uh, ironically or perhaps paradoxically a moment when, when the seeds of failure were being planted. And that was planted in this kind of erosion of the club. And I, I use the term in the book, uh, 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 the, the club broke down and we now have a shopping mall where, where everybody can kind of come in and, and selectively pick what store you want to go to, but you aren't obligated to, to uh, uphold the system or to make costly compromises. And so uh, that's where I'll end it now and just uh, e eager to get your thoughts. But uh, I, I do think that um, that points in the direction of, of some of the things that I think might follow in the next era if liberal internationalism is to have one. Yes, well, uh, you know, I, I keep looking at that picture you have in the background and St. Uh, Paul's Cathedral amidst the blitz surrounded by smoke and fire and yet persisting and and remaining and sustaining itself, which really, I mean, I, in the, in the end, I think that's where you want to be and where you believe that ultimately will be, but getting from here to there, uh, certainly there's complexities. You talked about the club. I was quite struck by the juxtaposition you had between the notion of um, democracy, liberal democracy as a club with all the logic of conditionality that you mentioned, and then the transition to public utility, which certainly is valuable uh, to the world. And we, uh, you know everyone can benefit from it, but where it's easier for people to be, or entities, nation states, or whatever, to be free riders, to take uh, the benefits and not to uh, pay the costs. And also, uh, and I think back about your previous book, you know, After Victory, which really stirred me as well. And in the shadow of victory, you know, having the magnanimity to create a system that's con uh, constitutional into which other parties buy in. And the fact that other uh, countries, smaller nations, smaller groups uh, buy into it makes it stable. And certainly, in the early days, uh, those become the proudest moments of the hegemon by, uh, and the, the fact that, they're, that uh, that order then persists for, for so long uh, into the future. 
uh, but there's, you know, it's hard to be a free rider in a club, but as you become a public utility, either you can be, you can be a free rider first and then gradually become larger and larger and stronger so that, and you point this out, you know, you have the autonomy to begin to create some kind of a counter uh, system if, um, and, and if, you know, the, the one thinks, uh, for example, and I was all through what you said, inevitably, the, the question particularly of China, not just of China, but you get um, soft authoritarian or non-liberal uh, democratic states that become powerful uh, within the system. And then the system has this utility, uh, public utility nature uh, that makes, it's harder to sanction uh, outsiders, especially if, if they're powerful. And so, um, you know, what, what kind of uh, new problems uh, does, does that, create. Um, and in particular, I wonder about uh, transnational uh, linkages between uh, these illiberal actors or, or rather uh, authoritarian actors in, in the system like uh, China and then um, illiberal democracies as well. Uh, for example, the relation, the relation with say Orban's Hungary uh, who, of course, has uh, a veto inside the uh, European Union. So it makes it difficult for even groups of like-minded democracies to, to work together to defend their interests and defend their values, doesn't it? Absolutely. I, I think, uh, in some ways, the, the, you made a good point that, that inside of Europe, you have a similar logic. You, you think of the liberal order as as kind of layers uh, of order, really. And the European Union is in many ways the quiet, one of the quiet anchors of the larger global liberal order. Uh, and it too, uh, in its own way, has had a kind of logic of conditionality to join uh, the EU, uh, uh, has been entailed uh, a logic of conditionality, uh, 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 treaty agreements and a, a non-democracies are not welcome, that, that kind of logic. Indeed, uh, the countries that, that joined uh, the European Union after the end of the Cold War were partly looking for that kind of uh, conditionality in that uh, 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 these countries transitioning towards, towards uh, the Western style polities were, were hoping to reinforce, for example, civilian control of the military, rule of law to to, uh, to uh, provide constitutional structures that would uh, uh, cut against uh, uh, autocracy and uh, corruption. Uh, but, but like the larger liberal order, Europe is having in the face of, of Hungary and to some extent Poland, finding that logic of conditionality difficult to uphold. And, and there's a struggle going on now. And I think that European leaders know that, that there has to be a response uh, to countries that are actively trying to, to undermine uh, uh, the kinds of cooperation, doing so even though in the case of countries like Hungary, are, they are huge beneficiaries of mm -hmm. EU funds. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that's a kind of the larger system is, is, is suffering a similar logic as you suggested. Mm -hmm. Well, then um, if one operates under a veto principle or, or rather unanimity principle like the European Union does, then how does one create, and I, you've written about this elsewhere, I thought very interestingly noted that at China really, even if it is growing, of course, it's still a minor fraction of the entire global political economy. So collaborative uh, behavior among uh, democracies uh, certainly can constrain uh, any uh, one individual actor. Uh, does that mean yeah. coalitions of the willing or some new new forms of coalition? Uh, uh, they say European Union and so on may not be able to, to counteract or countervail. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's, that's where the action is now, is how, how do we think about 
the next generation of, of, of coalitions of the willing, uh, like-minded states that want to work together to uh, preserve and extend uh, liberal democratic social purposes, uh, the Biden administration clearly has this in mind when they talk about uh, uh, partnerships and, uh, and and alliances. I think uh, Biden's uh, 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 UN General Assembly speech last, last month, he, he used the word alliance eight times and partnership 16 times. So the, the, that's the language of, of, of building coalitions. I, I don't think it's necessarily simply the old group uh, uh, saddling up and riding again uh, to the rescue. I think uh, uh, new forms of, of cooperative behavior uh, um, in each of the various zones of competition with China and other non-democratic countries. In Asia, uh, obviously, they're the kind of, you know, the quad is a, is a, a very a kind of a, hall, a hallmark of, of the kind of things that might uh, emerge uh, in, in the future. Uh, uh, both kind of having a, a, a kind of balancing logic, but also a kind of um, order ordering logic. Uh, uh -huh. you would, the TPP, if, if that were to be resurrected, and I know that uh, Biden uh, officials are, are know that the TPP uh, is, is critical to, to the kind of reconstructing uh, trade that, that, uh, that keeps uh, labor, labor rights and environmental rights and, and intellectual property rights and, and uh, 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 restraints on state, state firms that, 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 that dump, uh, dump uh, with subsidies into markets. That kind of um, uh, coalition in these different realms, I think, is, is where, where the activity needs to be. Uh -huh. It can't be America simply imposing uh, its liberal hegemony on the world. I don't think it ever was able to do that, even when it was more, more capable than it is today. But what do you think, John, what do you think of uh, proposals from the Biden administration about a conference of democracies? And because they're not the first, John McCain some years ago was interested in this idea. Well, if you can go back to Immanuel Kant in some <laughs> ways for, as well, of course, the notion of a league of democracies in this 21st century, you know, what, and of course that we may see an international conference coming up. What kind of an agenda do you think it should have? Is that useful? I do think it's useful, uh, properly organized. I, 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 I'm not, uh, while I think that China and the, the, the illiberal and anti-democratic world is sharpening the lines of division and 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 uh, sharpening the sense of what the stakes are involved in in this kind of struggle for for uh, for for the world. Uh, uh, I don't think it necessarily uh, can be a kind of Cold War block against block. I, I don't think uh, America's uh, even it's America's strongest liberal democratic allies in Western Europe and East Asia want that kind of uh, block struggle between the free world and the, the non-free world. I, I think that's counterproductive, uh, 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 but these kind of more floating coalitions and alignments uh, that, that uh, are slightly different in each zone of competition. I, I do think that the, the Biden proposal uh, is very much a, a kind of uh, uh, more soft, soft kind of uh, seizing the global narrative kind of initiative than it is concrete uh, takeaways for, for uh, managing the international system. I think it's about uh, trying to, to push back on the democratic recession, to, to, to uh, let countries that want to come to come and talk about how they can uh, individually and together uh, uh, solve problems of liberal democracy. Uh, we have a lot to learn from each other. The United States has a lot to learn from other democracies about how to do healthcare and, and even elections. And uh, other countries have uh, likewise have things to learn from, from others, uh, from uh -huh. third countries. So, so I, I think-, I think 
some kind of a concrete agenda, then we think we've got to think seriously about and not simply sort of cooperation of democracies, but functional cooperation of different kinds. I, I, I think so. And, you know, on different matters, uh, it, each different realms of competition, I think technology standards, uh, I, I think the Biden administration has a lot of, is doing a lot of thinking as others outside of the administration are on, on uh, sort of, uh, sort of technology, next generation technologies uh, are, are ones that uh, can be more or less uh, 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 sort of congenial with uh, norms of liberal democracy, transparency, uh, um, open system kinds of norms. So uh, one, one point I think that we know, we, we, we understand better now than we did say 20 years ago is that multilateralism and international institutions are not value neutral. They're not value neutral, that they, they can bias the playing field uh, in one direction or the other. And, and that kind of, that China knows that. Uh, and, and so whether it's human rights standards, whether it's in trade agreements, what kinds of, 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 of principles are embedded in the, in the trade agreements, uh, technology standards. I think that's where a lot of 21st century world politics is, is headed. Uh, it's, it's about uh, those kind of platforms and regimes. For collaboration. You know, I, I should just uh, tell our audience, we're beginning to get uh, questions in the chat and uh, people, everyone um, is warmly welcome to begin to send in uh, questions and comments for uh, Professor Eikenberry. Uh, maybe as those begin, if I, uh, John, if I might um, just ask uh, about one other dimension we haven't covered. And as I remember, it's something, uh, your book of course deals particularly with the role of nation states and the transformation of their roles over time. And I'm just wondering uh, what you think about the role of subnational actors like cities and NGOs, uh, maybe even some illiberal uh, uh, groups uh, as well as we've seen emerging in the, you know, the last five years, especially in either sustaining or impeding uh, liberal internationalism. Yes, well, let me say a couple things about that. And I know your, your most recent book, uh, Global Cities is, is, is really, uh, 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 groundbreaking in, in, in looking at how cities have become hubs and uh, they, they confound uh, uh, global maps that simply look at nation states, that, that the subnational level is where a lot of networking is, a uh, uh, lot of uh, 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 real kind of real um, uh, uh, programmatic efforts to create uh, uh, environments for sustainable living in, in urban settings and, and elsewhere. Um, when I wrote this book, I, I, I went back to the 19th century, a uh, hundred years before Woodrow Wilson, uh, uh, partly uh, to prepare for looking at the hundred years after Woodrow Wilson. But in the 19th century, this was the, the, the invention of internationalism, uh, which became uh, the, the grist for uh, a World War I uh, type uh, programmatic efforts uh, that Wilson and Robert Cecil on the British side, the, the great thinkers of the League and then later the United Nations, uh, they were really very much uh, learning and drawing lessons and, and, and building on the, 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 the internationalism of the 19th century. And much of that internationalism was non-state internationalism. Uh, uh, coalitions of, of jurists, were critical for forging international law, both uh, nation state Westphalian international law and, and quite frankly, imperial uh, international law. Um, the, the peace movement was critical. The, parliamentar the parliamentarians uh, uh, assemblies uh, uh, between 1815 and 1914, uh, 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 there were over a thousand uh, uh, meetings in Europe uh, of one sort or another of, of, of different groups, uh, uh, some of them governments, but, but mostly uh, these act activist groups that were coming out of the nation states that were just being assembled, uh, uh, women's groups, 
uh, with uh, suffrage uh, agenda, um, uh, the trade trade agreements, of course, the 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 free trade movement. So so the history of liberal internationalism and order building, the 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 energy comes out of these societies, and indeed, uh, the civil society is partly what a uh, uh, liberal international order preserves and what is threatened by by the illiberalism and the uh, anti-liberal and anti-democratic uh, polities that are on the outside. Uh, China is very much um, uh, putting what what is there in China that we call civil society at risk. Uh, 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 it's no longer out of reach of the predatory state. I think the civil societies are where as liberals celebrate uh, is where uh, realms of autonomy and voluntary association, uh, uh, innovation of ideas, the protection of uh, and, and, and uh, preservation of identities, racial, religious, ethnic, um, mm -hmm. minorities can uh, have uh, protection. So, um, and, it, and as you say, it's where a lot of the international or transnational uh, activity is. And I think that's true today mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in these kinds of coalitions uh, on the democratic side. But as you alluded to, Kent, I think what you're, what's very interesting today, I would say interesting and worrisome, is how uh, uh, the kind of authoritarian internationalism and illiberal internationalism uh, it's not an accident that some American uh, uh, far-right figures uh, travel to Hungary uh, to make common cause uh, and, and, and elsewhere. Like so uh, uh, internationalism goes both ways, so to speak. It can be uh, it can be at the service of many different values. You know, John, uh, we're getting some questions here and. One interesting one, this is actually from uh, one of our, our PhD students who said she's been an ardent reader of yours uh, since undergrad. <laughs> and uh, she sees a increasing uh, pessimism about the uh, viability of the order without strong US leadership. Um, she says that um, in the liberal Leviathan, you were arguing that liberal order will last even without strong leadership because other states benefit from that. And of course, you, that's something you stressed in after victory, all of these new interests that uh, be it Germany, Japan, or whomever gained in the system. But now uh, you seem to be uh, more pessimistic about the prospect for liberal democracy. Uh, well, and the question is, is it the openness of liberal democracy that is creating this crisis? Or is it a, a lack of US strategy? Or is this just the rise of an outside power like, well, a preeminently China that is creating a, a very different dynamic? How do you respond to that? Yes, that's a great question. And I thank uh, your student uh, uh, for reading my work. And and, and I think uh, she she's correct that that I, I, he did, I actually it may be he he or she is, is is correct that I um I, I I'm more pessimistic about about uh liberal order without some kind of uh hegemonic for political formation and I use that term to as a substitute for American hegemony because uh, one can imagine uh, a consortium of of powerful states uh, uh working together in some ways that's what what you kind of think about when you think about the G7, but but I, I have the the student is correct that I've kind of waxed and waned on on how important is it to have a hegemonic state at the center of the system to keep the system open and and liberal. Uh, that's a an old argue, a question research question in, in internet the international relations theory uh, uh, from Kendallberger and Krasner and Gilpin. Yeah. Uh, who do do make the strong argument that uh, the the hegemonic state does a lot of work uh, and uh, uh, left to its own devices, uh, societies kind of uh, and spiral downward and and you you don't have those kind of infrastructural supports that 
need to be in place so that societies can bargain and can can make trade-offs and manage interdependence so that it's sustainable with, with the democratic society. Like Bob was always worrying about, remember in our discussions with Bob Gilpin. Absolutely. Yeah. And and I I've uh, you know when the, you know the 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 Trump administration kind of made me realize that uh, if the United States truly steps back and, and says, we don't want any more of this. You know, kind of, it was kind of America's Brexit, you know, uh, 2016, uh, US and, and Britain, the two states that have had more of a liberal imprint on the world than any others, uh, Britain in the 19th century, US in the 20th century, seeing these two states pull back and say, we've had enough, we want off the merry-go-round, we don't want to be, be running uh, these orders anymore. Uh, either because we can't or the costs seem to exceed the benefits. I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely the case that you need to have strong states committed to, to, to upholding the order. And uh, this is where I, 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 some, I find myself in, in a kind of uh, uh, lively debate with, with some of uh, the people who call themselves restrainers, who, 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 um, think that America's far-flung uh, security order, uh, the bases, the alliances, uh, the American system of, of partnership that, as you rightly said, I, I, I talk about theoretically in the book After Victory um, and try to suggest why that's important for creating, the, uh, creating open, uh, reciprocal, legitimate, rule-based order, uh, such as it is, that... Uh, I do think that if America withdrew from East Europe, Eastern Europe, East 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 Asia, and and withdrew from from Europe, if NATO uh, and uh, the alliances in East Asia were to disappear, uh, I think we would, uh, in, in important ways, put this question to a test. And I'm not ha I'm I'm not confident that that the outcome would be well. Uh, let's keep the system going, even though the United States is not, not uh, uh, in some sense, underwriting the core parts of this and, ke and keeping the system a kind of cooperative security system. I, 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 the longer I go in my career, the more I think that's important. And I would hate to put that, that, that uh, proposition to a test. The cooperative security side. Now, uh, several questions actually here relate to this question of, of uh, cooperative security in some um, new areas, sort of areas of the future. The two of them were um, cyber and space. And uh, I guess the implication, we've been talking about collaboration among democracies. Uh, and I guess maybe the one aspect of that is, are there particular ways that it's important for the democracies to collaborate, or how do they deal with other uh, parties, the you know authoritarian uh, states, on th those kind of questions? Both space and security, of course, do have national security. They have security dimensions, but then they've also got just sort of functional. Um, you know, they're, they're, they do have a cooperative security dimension as well. How should liberal democracies approach uh, cooperation both among each other and then with authoritarian spaces, states in those areas? Yeah, I think that's a, one of the best and hardest questions uh, that uh, you could pose. So I appreciate that question. And uh, I'd start by saying that looking over the last 200 years, liberal democracies have thought about how they should interact with illiberal states along a full spectrum of, uh, of mutual neglect and uh, coexistence uh, to, to engagement, uh, to actively trying to overturn and uh, um, uh, and and uh, tr transform uh, those regimes into regimes more like us. Uh, so the whole spectrum, and indeed, um, Woodrow Wilson, uh, as I mentioned at the very end of my book, even during his presidency, he started out thinking the League was was 
was to be for everybody, that, that what you didn't have to be a democracy to be in the League of Nations, because he thought that if you got non-democracies in, there would be a kind of socialization effect. But then when, when the U.S. got into the war and he was, uh, in some sense, using the war, the kind of U.S. was not just um, uh, in the war to protect itself, it was a war to, to uh, overturn German autocracy. There was a real kind of, uh, you only liberal democracies are worthy of being in the international community. Uh, so that was a very absolutist sta statement of phase for Wilson. And then after the war, he went back to his earlier position that, that it, there is, isn't a membership requirement. So my first point is that liberal internationalists have been all over the map on this and, uh, and certainly engaging China, as I've suggested, I, I, I'm very much my written records in the 90s and afterwards with your know, liberal grand strategy of bringing uh, China in, hoping that it will incentivize a, a kind of more cooperative relationship. But uh, today I'm much more of the view that we need to re rebuild this kind of logic of conditionality in certain realms. But Kent, I, I would say the bottom line is that uh, you have to you have to do both in today's world. You have to be uh, uh, you have to prepare for pretty intensive uh, engagement of China and Russia on arms control, on global warming, on uh, 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 refugees and uh, pandemic, uh, public health, uh, and push for transparency. We uh, through the WHO. Uh, um, and, and we should remember that even during the Cold War, there was an incredible amount of cooperation on even in the area of arms control from, from the early arms control talks uh, through the SALT, SALT agreement. Uh, and of course, uh, the, through the WHO, the Soviet Union and the United States cooperated on eradicating smallpox. Uh, and so China and the United States are, are destined, cannot escape each other. It's going to be a two superpower world uh, uh, and a three three superpower world if Europe were to 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 emerge as one, but 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 there's no uh, victory, so to speak, of one over the other. I think it's a long twilight kind of uh, um, uh, contest. It will be a competitive, strategically competitive environment. You, but you have to uh, find places where you can cooperate while simultaneously doing what what I. I, I, I say it at, in my book is, is essential if you want to, to, to preserve liberal democratic social purposes, you've got to be able to build smaller coalitions of the of like-minded states uh, to protect uh, regimes and, and international agreements on, in trade and human rights and the environment where, where um, if, if you simply have a kind of lowest common denominator normative environment, a kind of Westphalian, everybody do as you want, it is corrosive of the social purposes at the heart of the liberal democratic world. So you have to do both. You have to walk and chew gum. You have to build zones of cooperation among like-minded states to preserve higher level order that is more than simply Westphalia. Mm -hmm. it's, it is, well, it is uh, something that uh, we, 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 we've, we, we appreciate, we want to preserve. We see it in Europe, across the continent. We see it across the larger democratic see, world. Then you, you can really see cross-cutting. I guess if I understand you, one of your main uh, points is that we don't want to get into a very narrowly sort of Cold War type uh, situation where all of the conflicts and all of the coalitions are on precisely the same line and probably not even to make a lit litmus test of, of democ democracy on, on many issues. Functional cooperation across these barriers with China in other countries in some areas is quite important. Am I right? That's right. And I, 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 you know, I think that China is going to try to argue if you want if you want our cooperation on climate change then you're going to have to step back on um, 
Taiwan or Hong Kong or the Uyghurs or other issues where we have differences that are rooted in our different values, I, I think you can't accept that. I think you, I, I think China in effect is saying with that argument, uh, if you if you don't step back on these human rights issues, we'll shoot ourselves in the head. <laughs> no, I, China has a absolute interest in working with other countries on mitigating climate change. And uh, I think we, we can have a, we aren't there yet, but I think we, we can build a, a, a relationship where we can, where we can both cooperate and compete. And uh, I, I don't, I don't see how we you have could... leverage with China. Where do we have leverage with China? Well, I think the, in different, I, I think uh, you, we have leverage in that our allies uh, in East Asia want to live in a world that is not simply uh, one with, with that increasingly is dominated by China, that they want to have a, a world where they can gain economic benefits from trading with uh, China, investing, uh, but, but getting security from uh, outside of the outside of the China relationship. So the, a world where, where, uh, where, uh, where they can be part of, of the, 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 the American security system. So I think we have leverage in that uh, frontline states want to have it both ways. They want to have stable relations with China, but they want to stay connected to the United States. And, and so uh, China uh, 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 is restrained in some sense by the backlash that comes from an overly aggressive China. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the, the post Bismarck Germany, what diplomatic historians call the, the problem of self encirclement. If you become too bellicose, you, you push states away from you. And, and so the United States as a kind of offshore security partner has a huge amount of leverage to the extent it, it provides a, a safe haven for countries that that want to uh, have a, a, a hedged relationship with China, with China. Mm -hmm. and I think I think in in the long run, uh, values that uh, freedom of expression, uh, individual rights, accountable government, transparency, civil society outside the reach of the state. I think these are values that they can survive the 21st century. So that part of the leverage is is the moral high ground. Um, uh, I think the third form of leverage is, is uh, the critical mass leverage that I, we've been talking about uh, over and over today, that, that yeah. the, 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 the democracies are better when they hang together because as Ben Franklin said, if you don't hang together, this is yeah, what he said to the 13 colonists, we will certainly hang separately. I, I think, uh, creating a kind of critical mass so that you can drive reform of global rules and institutions, that's the, the third form of leverage. Well, that becomes really quite crucial, doesn't it? The, the transatlantic relationship and also the, well, the G7 relationships in particular. Do you, do you think it's fair to say that uh, the G7 has become more important in recent years than it previously was. I I, I do. I think uh, it's certainly um, been a, a place where Biden can go to try to uh, re rebuild uh, relations, a kind of cooperative coalitional uh, uh, leadership uh, uh, relations that are very, you know, the the G system is so useful because it's not formal. You don't have to do treaties back home. Uh, it, it, it has a kind of, uh, kind of, it's more like jazz than it is like Bach and classical music. It's more it's imp improvisational. Uh, but I, I, I would, Kent, I would say that another uh, G group, or I think it's sometimes called a D group because it's a D for democracy, the D10, the, the so-called high, high capacity democracies that have been meeting uh -huh. Uh, the policy planning directors of the uh, D10, uh, uh, the Atlantic Council has been an important uh, support of that and, and their counter counterparts uh, as think tanks and the other 
other eight plus EU countries um, are critical. Uh, uh, the, so I think not just the, D7, the G7, but, but uh, uh, South Korea, Australia uh, are, are also important and other countries that, that might uh, in various ad hoc ways be part of this, this mm -hmm. coalition. That's very interesting. You know, uh, finally, uh, there, there is one thing that was really striking to me in your book, apart from, of course, St. Paul's and the enduring um, uh, nature uh, of democracy that you so eloquently write about. And it was right toward the end. Uh, you write about the importance of a 21st century Wilsonian moment. And I wonder if you could give us a little more detail as to what you conceive of that uh, to be and how we can go about uh, moving toward it. Yeah, I, I, there's a reason that was at the end of the book because I, I didn't quite know how one could write a whole chapter about it because that is a kind of uh, evocative uh, effort to, to to, to say what I wanted to say in the book, which is every generation has to kind of rethink and reinvent uh, uh, the, the, the system. Think about the United States itself. Uh, there's been, you know, the, 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 the American founding, but people talk about, uh, about, at, about Abraham Lincoln and the post-Civil War America as the second founding. And many people regard Roosevelt and the New Deal as America's third founding. And what I think we're, groping towards now is kind of a fourth founding in America. Uh, 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 and I, I, I can't, I think that Biden has a kind of vision of FDR and kind of, re, it's not just uh, passing budgets, but it's kind of rebuilding uh, social democracy at home and, and doing so in an international environment where we work with others uh, for mutual gain. Um, so, uh, that what I mean by a Wilsonian moment is is kind of that kind of reinvention moment where we look back at the at the failures and accomplishments and kind of throw the net out there and see what we can catch. Uh, Roosevelt uh, Wilson, uh, uh, while the hero of my book is really Roosevelt Wilson, um, uh, is is still somebody that I I think is worthy of of reading about and thinking about partly because of his complexity on, uh, as we all know, his, his racism, uh, something that we should uh, remember and, uh, and reckon with, but, but also the, the kind of impact he had uh, building into the international order a, a norm of democracy, of self-determination. Wilson should get credit for that. Wilson and the 14 points. Wilson versus Lenin. Versus, Wilson versus Wilson and, and Poland. There's, Wilson was very important in not so much creating new ideas. He wasn't a, he wasn't, he didn't have a brilliant new uh, kind of lightning strike moment of, of insight. He was taking 19th century notions of internationalism and, and braiding them together. Uh, international law, uh, the peace movement, arms control, trade, and, and so his, his contribution, the Wilsonian moment, was kind of packaging or, 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 or braiding the threads of internationalism. And the threads have been kind of uh, unraveling in the post-Cold War period. Uh, uh, we have neoliberalism more than liberal internationalism. We, we've lost what, what uh, our late great colleague uh, John Ruggie called embedded liberalism. So the Wilsonian moment today is partly Reweaving re them, the threads of internationalism, adding new ones, uh, and adding new countries, uh, surveying what what works. Uh, it it probably won't be big treaties, it won't be another United Nations. It will be, um, it will be uh, these more ad hoc coalitions, I think, uh, um, and uh, it will be a more uh, multi level chess board that we would be playing on, lots of different uh, uh, platforms of, of comp comp competition and cooperation. But I do think uh, the, the big vision, uh, we aren't there yet, but a, a vi vision of, 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 of a, a kind of a new imaginary of, of cooperation, 
where we realize that that uh, the, the 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 environment in which each of our countries uh, exists and our very values that we want to pass on to our children uh, uh, require pretty hard work at at structuring the international system because it's only going to get worse, and uh, we need to 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 um, catch up. The demand for uh, liberal order is going up. It's not going down, uh, but uh, the supply is very much uh, uh, um, not there yet. So I think a Wilsonian moment of 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 of, of creative uh, reinvention is what I would hope that our generation, or at least our children's generation, could could do because that's what I I read when I read Ira Katz Nelson's book about the generation of 1945, and and I think. Uh, uh, the next generation uh, 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 has 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 an obligation to do it again. Well, as I think you know, I have a great personal affection for Princeton. We still spend a lot of time there. I'm an emeritus faculty member, but I must say that the, looking to the and looking to the future, I'm sure that as in the day of Woodrow Wilson, Princeton will have an important role in this. You may know this, but uh, SICE is moving about uh, another year and a half to 555 Pennsylvania Avenue, right next to in the shadow of Capitol Hill. And uh, this question I'm quite taken, you talk about multiple platforms, about um, you know convening, and also of course the articulation of ideas. and certainly something that is a mutual uh, enterprise. And I, I do think that um, there's going to be a lot of need for a lot of talking and thinking. Um, I was about to wonder as uh, whether we there may, may need, well, leadership is certainly going to be a big part of this if one thinks about act after victory and some, of course, in the case of World War II itself, we might have had Roosevelt doing a lot of the spade route, probably considerably more than is generally realized. But you also had the, you know, the Atchisons, and you had the Marshalls, and you had the people. So some room for leadership, but also for platforms of various kinds. Yes. And, uh, I, um, I'm sure we'll be talking more about this. And, you know, as we move toward 555 Penn, we certainly look forward to having you <laughs> come down and talking about this as we uh, move toward, uh, you know, thinking more about these issues. Well, thank you, Kent. It's, it's a pleasure to be with you. And, I, and, and, and best wishes to Sice as you uh, make that move. You, uh, it's a beautiful building and you have a beautiful view. And I, I'm sure you will never, uh, while the American capital has a kind of residence, a kind of Christopher Wren kind of dome uh, that uh, makes it look like the picture in, on my book. I, I, fortunately, we don't have smoke coming up. Uh, and yeah. uh, But if, if it ever happens, you'll be the first to see it. <laughs> I, I, I think uh, it's, it's definitely um, appropriate for your school to be there. It will be right there in the middle of 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 uh, of American uh, democracy and uh, uh, and the you have the right people the students who uh, who uh, are as I've just said in our last exchange are really the the generation that are going to have a lot of work to do and and uh, uh, and, and so I I'm just so thrilled to be able to to at least speak with with uh, with some of your students today and and look forward to a chance to to continue the conversation in person. Uh, after your move, uh, when conditions uh, when conditions are, are ready. So uh, thank you so much, Ken. Well, thank you, John. Uh, I think we've all uh, thoroughly enjoyed this. We appreciate all of your thoughts. Uh, the book, of course, uh, is one that uh, I'm sure all who haven't read it, a world safe for democracy. We'll look forward to reading as well. So uh, uh, thanks again. I'll be well. Thanks to our audience. And let's continue the dialogue. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. Take care.